Right guys, welcome to attachment lesson 7. In this video we're going to be looking at types of attachment and the strange situation. As always we'll spend a bit of time on the outline first before going on to the evaluation points and then we'll end with a six mark example outline which will set the scene nicely for any potential essay on this topic. The timestamps in the description will let you navigate to a particular section of the video if you're looking for something specific, but whether you're looking for something specific or not, a like would be amazing if you find this video useful. So, The Strange Situation was developed by a student of John Bowlby's called Mary Ainsworth as a method of assessing the quality of attachment between a baby and a caregiver by observing key attachment behaviours occurring between the two of them. The procedure is very simple. It's a controlled observation that takes place in a room with a two-way mirror through which psychologists can observe the baby's behaviour. Now, if you can't remember what a controlled observation is, the link to the video on observations should be appearing on your screen now so you can go and remind yourself. Overall, there are five behaviours that are being observed and each of them are scored for intensity on a scale of 1 to 7. Those behaviours are proximity seeking, which is whether the baby will attempt to stay close to the caregiver or not, Exploration and secure base behaviour, which looks at the infant's confidence around exploring the unknown environment that they're in, but also looks at how often the baby uses the caregiver as a source of security. So you might see the infant look back and check that mum is still there, or they might go back to mum every now and again before venturing back out into the room. Stranger and separation anxiety are exactly what it says on the tin. How distressed does the infant get when a stranger enters the room and when the caregiver leaves the room? And then finally, reunion behaviour looks at the infant's response to the caregiver returning after having left. And those behaviours are observed across seven individual episodes, each of which is designed to test one or more of the behaviours in question. So, for example, episode two will look at stranger anxiety because we'd expect most children to be anxious around an unknown adult. Whereas episode 5, on the other hand, would be looking at separation anxiety, again because we'd expect many infants to experience distress when their caregiver leaves. Episode 4, however, would be looking at both reunion behaviour and exploration and secure base behaviour. I'm not going to go through all the stages because they're fairly self-explanatory, but I do just want to skip ahead for a minute and talk about outlining the strange situation. So when you write a 6 marker for this, and you'll see this a bit later on when I show you the model that I've got, you don't need to list off every single stage of the strange situation. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can if you really want to, but you run the risk of your outline feeling a little bit listy and not having a nice flow. So one nice way to do it would be to just give a couple of examples of the episodes as part of your outline, which is what I've done and which is what you'll see towards the end of the video. Now, after conducting their research, Ainsworth and her colleagues found that there were distinct patterns in the way the babies behaved in the strange situation, and from that they identified three main types of attachment. Those were secure, insecure avoidant, and insecure resistant. Secure attachments were the most common, with around 66% of babies being classified as secure in the strange situation. These are children that explore happily, but regularly return back to their secure base. They show moderate separation anxiety and stranger anxiety, and they need and accept comfort upon reunion, which effectively means that they're clearly happy to see their caregiver, and they also allow themselves to be comforted by their caregiver. This behaviour is thought to be a result of having emotionally available caregivers who provide consistent nurture and care and are responsive to the needs of their children. Now, at this point, I will just point out that all the percentages for the attachment types will vary by culture. So, for example, the percentages for secure attachment are much higher than 66% in Britain. However, 66% is an average across a variety of studies conducted. And in the next video on cultural variations in attachment, we'll go into more detail on the different results across the world. So, the second most common attachment type in the strange situation was insecure avoidant, with around 22% of babies being classified as this. These children explore freely, but they do not display proximity or secure base behaviour. They don't show distress upon being left alone or seeing a stranger. They also don't require comfort upon reunion. These are kids who are displaying behaviour that looks like they're not bothered about strangers, not bothered about being left alone, 
or about being comforted. They're trying to show a certain degree of independence because that's something that parents have encouraged them to do through potentially being emotionally unavailable or unresponsive to their children's needs. Now, just to be clear, just because they're not showing that they're distressed doesn't mean that they're not experiencing distress, but they're trying to keep grips on their emotions and they're trying to handle it independently. Okay. Now, the least common attachment type was insecure resistant, with only 12% of infants receiving this classification in the strange situation. Children who are insecure resistant seek greater proximity to their caregivers and they explore less. They also show extreme separation and stranger anxiety and they resist comfort upon reunion. Now, this resistance to comfort is interesting because children who are resistant both crave comfort but also resist it. So they're mad with their caregivers for leaving and they want to punish them for leaving, but equally they need the comfort now that they're back. So they're showing a really inconsistent and confused set of emotions. And this often comes from an ambivalent or inconsistent style of parenting where the caregivers are both responsive and unavailable in equal measure. So an example of what that means is the caregiver may give the impression that they're about to interact with the child, but then they might end up doing something completely different like play on their phone and end up ignoring them. Or they might ignore the infant when they're crying and clearly need some care, but then they might go and play with the infant when they're sleeping and they don't need care or something like that. Ultimately, they're showing an ambivalent and inconsistent parenting style, which leads to confusion in the child. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the outline and the start of the evaluation section. I've got quite a few evaluation points for you, but then you can just pick and choose the ones that you want and the ones that you like. Okay, so one strength of the strange situation is that its outcome predicts a number of aspects of the baby's later development. A large body of research has shown that babies and toddlers assessed as secure tend to have better outcomes than others, both in childhood and in adulthood. So, for example, in childhood, secure babies often have better achievement in school and less involvement in bullying. They also tend to go on and have better mental health in adulthood. Whereas those babies assessed as having insecure resistant attachment and those babies not falling into any types suggested by Ainsworth tend to have the worst outcomes. And that suggests that the strange situation is measuring something real and something meaningful in a baby's development. It has good predictive validity. However, whilst the strange situation clearly measures something important associated with later development, not all psychologists believe that this thing is in fact attachment. So, for example, Kagan suggests that genetically influenced anxiety levels could account for variations in attachment behavior and later development. And this is known as the temperament hypothesis. Okay, so what Kagan is effectively saying is that the behavior, the anxiety that we see in the strange situation could be down to something like the fact that my baby might be very, very laid back or my baby might be hyper anxious, let's say. Okay, and we're not actually measuring attachment quality or attachment security at all. We're actually measuring something like anxiety levels that's more genetically influenced. And it's those anxiety levels that are then also going to go on later in life to affect a person's behavior rather than the attachment. Okay, so you've got a nice little strength and a counterpoint that you can use there. Use them together because the one links to the other quite nicely and it will provide you with a nice structure and a nice flow in your evaluation section. Now, a further strength of the strange situation is that it has good inter-rater reliability. So when testing the inter-rater reliability, Bick et al. found 94% agreement between the observers. Now, the high level of reliability could be because the observations took place under strict and controlled conditions using predetermined behavior categories that involve large movements and therefore were easy to observe. 
For example, anxious babies cry and crawl away from strangers, which is something that everybody can see. However, regardless of where the high interrater of reliability comes from, the fact that it exists means that findings are considered more meaningful because we can be confident that an attachment type identified in the string situation doesn't depend on subjective opinion. Now, moving on to a limitation, the strange situation may not be valid in different cultural contexts. So, the strange situation was developed in Britain and the US, therefore it may be culture-bound, which means that it may only be valid for use in certain cultures, in this case, European cultures and the US. The reason for that is that babies may have had different experiences in different cultures, and these experiences may affect their behavior in the strange situation. So, for example, in one Japanese study, babies displayed very high levels of separation anxiety, and so a disproportionate number of them were classified as insecure resistant. However, it suggested that that anxiety response was not due to high rates of attachment insecurity, but rather due to the unusual nature of the experience in Japanese culture, where mother-baby separation is very, very rare. Okay, so effectively, if you take a baby that's never separated from its mother and then separate them in the strange situation, of course that baby is going to show huge levels of separation anxiety. That doesn't mean that they are insecure resistant. That means that they're not used to it. And therefore, by Japanese standards, they're showing a very normal behavior. Okay, so that means that it's very difficult to know what the strange situation is actually measuring when it's used outside Europe and outside the US. Okay, and then a final limitation is the existence of a fourth category of attachment, which is type D, which is disorganized attachment. And disorganized attachment is a mix of resistant and avoidant behaviors. Now, this point is a little bit of a discussion point. There is a pro and a con hidden within one paragraph here. So it's a really nice, chunky evaluation point that you can use in a discussion type essay. So on the one hand, the addition of an extra attachment type appears to be a huge problem for Ainsworth because type D children display a distinctive mix of resistant and avoidant behaviors in the strange situation, which clearly shows that Ainsworth's categorization of types is incomplete. However, on the other hand, type D children are very unusual and type D behavior appears to be the result of experiencing some kind of severe neglect or abuse in early infancy. Therefore, type D attachment doesn't appear to be a normal variation in attachment. It could therefore be argued that Ainsworth's classification of avoidant, secure, and resistant attachment types is an adequate description of normal attachment types. Okay, so... Ainsworth's classification of attachment types holds up quite well as a description of normal variations in attachment. However, type D attachment adds something useful to the classifications that already exist in the form of an abnormal attachment type. Okay, and it also gives us something to be aware of, something for further investigation, for example. It opens up new avenues of research. Right then, just to finish off, here's an example six mark outline. I'm not going to read it to you. Feel free to pause the video and give it a quick read if you want. I just want to draw your attention to what I was saying earlier about not going through each of the stages. You can see that I've mentioned some of the stages briefly in the first paragraph, but after that I move on to the behaviors being observed and the findings. Also, Note that I haven't gone into detail about the type of behavior each attachment type showed in the study. You can add that if you want, but for me, the outline is already long enough and there's enough detail in there without adding that. It doesn't mean that it's not important. There'll be plenty of questions, potentially application questions or anything like that, where you will need to know that stuff. But in terms of putting it into an outline, I decided not to put it into mine. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's been useful and I hope everything has made sense. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I will see you in the next one.